Hello, everyone. Um, hi, I'm honored to introduce a set of games that can arm any veteran GM with new tools for their creative toolbox, GMless games. These games are distinguished by the fact that they either do not have a core facilitator running scenes or responsibilities are distributed amongst players. I know that suggesting GMs play the very games that decenter their role is somewhat provocative, but I think these games actually can empower GMs with new insights. These games feature many solutions to a number of problems that GMs are perennially challenged by. The background for this talk is the piece I prepared for this year's anthology, No Gods, No Masters, an overview of unfacilitated GM-less design frameworks. Today, I will focus on demonstrating uh, how conventional responsibilities held by GMs are readdressed in novel ways by GMless games. I then will make a historical claim about why GMless games are increasingly prominent. I say prominent because there is a flowering right now of GMless games. I will put into chat uh, links that collectively point to hundreds of them. I actually find it astonishing how many games today are embracing models that displace the GM. When I was growing up, my very conception of what a role-playing game was included someone who makes decisions about narrative. However, today I find myself at tables where GMS play is common. GMS games are well-liked, I believe, because they promise to make people feel empowered, to provide a space where creative inspiration is entirely welcomed, at least within the constraints of the game itself. All role-playing games have challenges, yet GMS games try to solve these in innovative ways. So the first challenge I'll talk about um, that is inherent in role-playing games is giving a sufficient degree of freedom so players have a real sense that they can do whatever they want, while also shaping play so there's a satisfying narrative climax toward the end of the session. A GM must also keep pace um, so that the game session will actually end on time. So the time management is a problem, and uh, GMS games address this in a few ways. Um, uh, the main way, though, is uh, using a timer. Um, so, for example, in, in the game Alice is Missing, um, it, it, it is a role-playing game about the disappearance of a high school junior. Um, in the game, participants play in tandem with a synced soundtrack, and when the soundtrack is over, so is the game. Another... Uh, problem, a challenge that uh, GMs often face is how to pull story threads out of conversations that may meander or devolve into comedy when it is inappropriate to do so. So to prevent this, GMs maintain tone um, by setting a good example and by giving direct reminders to the other players. Um, GMs games have their own tactics as well. So one game, uh, one way that GMs games sometimes uh, will challenge maintaining tone is using optional settings, um, which encourage a table to invest in a shared perspective. Dialect by Hakan Sayaloglu and Catherine Himes and Fiasco by Jason Morningstar are good examples. Dialect is a game in which players experience that language is death. Fiasco is a game in which players enjoy cinematic takes, uh, cinematic tales of small time capers gone disastrously wrong. Both dialect and fiasco use optional settings um, called backdrops to allow players to commit to a shared intention. So by having an entire group of players find consensus on what setting to engage with, these games ensure a heightened level of interest with the material. Often play people are more interested in enjoying what they themselves choose to play. Another challenge, the third I'll mention is uh, that James Confront is um, bringing all players up to speed on the rules. So conventionally, uh, GMs teach rules at the beginning and will explain others as necessary. Many GMless games employ a slideshow style of teaching where all the relevant information is taught similarly piecemeal, but at the start, um, point, point, point. And it is scripted in the game text itself um, how to relay this information. Uh, so for example, in For the Queen, which is a card-based storytelling game about loyalty by Alex Roberts, um, players are asked to take turns reading rules aloud. For the Queen uses a deck of cards and the explanation of play is broken up between the first 19 cards placed on top of the pile. The fourth challenge that GMs face um, in a 
role playing games in general is having asymmetrically heavy cognitive loads to deal with at the table. They must consider the greater arc of the narrative and present challenges that highlight player strengths and interests and relation to it. This is a lot to handle. In GMS games, um, uh, addressing or helping a G a player helping to break out that decision making um, is is important. Um, so, for example, in Ironsworn, players act as heroes who undertake perilous quests. Sean Tompkin, the designer of the game, encourages players to use a set of oracles or lists that help determine consequences when the result is unclear. The fifth challenge I'll talk about is um, uh, a risk, actually, that GMs face, and it's the temptation to lose sight of the importance of player character choices in shaping a narrative. So valuing a story over play is a pitfall that can result in what is called railroading, abusing narrative power by making player's choice illusionary. This phenomenon is most dangerous because it demonstrates a flawed perspective of what role-playing is meant to be. GMs who narrow choices of players so that they feel trapped teach a misguided notion that role-playing is about playing out a story like an actor would play a scene, and this is a mistake in my view. Um, GMs games often are explicit of what, what they think role-playing is about. So for example, Izuba's Bed and Breakfast is a game about guests at a magical inn. It's from Possum Creek Games. The game text suggests that cheating itself is okay and says not to take the rules too serious so quote all rules are the same even the rules in this book are just like bedtimes or calendars you could just ignore them if it makes you happy if players don't like a rule that game says they can cheat the game teaches itself and does not rely on the instincts of a gm challenge number six another problem gms face is remembering narrative continuity GMS games take on this challenge in stride, often attempting to create systems that either record information or to make remembering at all unnecessary. So, uh, for example, Red Carnations on a Black Grave by Catherine Mulan takes a latter approach. Hers is a game about the lives of working class people caught up in the doomed events of the Paris Commune. In the game, the designer uses a pre-made deck of cards with questions that provide screen uh, scene prompts. And when the action lulls special inspiration cards, function to produce narrative beats. The seventh challenge that GMs often face um, is being expected to keep all the players physically comfortable. Um, and everyone has different needs, so this is a challenge, actually. Uh, GMs games often try to design player comfort um, in the text itself. So many will even spell out recipes that um, players who host the session, right, who, like, preserve the space, uh, may use to create meals that perfectly fit the game. So Dream Askew and Dream Apart are two games I'll mention later, and each use, um, they have recipes in the books. But another game uh, that uses food to establish a sense of comfort explicitly is Cozy Town by Rain Ajadi. So Cozy Town is a game about the changing seasons of a small village of animal citizens. Uh, in the game, uh, players are given the opportunity to explore what makes, quote, people and the communities they live in feel safe and cozy, end quote. To do so, the game states that the author, quote, highly recommends setting out teas and sweets or whatever you would, uh, will make you feel soft, warm, and happy, end quote. By serving up pastries, the game hopes to inspire players to create a lovely community and their sweet inhabitants and make sure everyone is having a good time. The eighth challenge that gem games have is, uh, well, all games, really, um, is that, well, not GM games, uh, is that while players generally take on only one character at a time, the, M the GM is pressured to take on all of the parts other than the player characters, and so they have to be continuously on and energized um, and performing without a break. Uh, this is a, a big burden. So in GMS games, by contrast, all the players uh, share many voices. They, they have many roles. So um, the Deep Forest by Mark Diaz Truman and Avery Alder is a game in which players embody groups of monsters. And the game, quote, asks players to speak as various monsters in the community and takes actions on their behalf, indicating which monster they're speaking or acting as, end quote. You're not expected to feel that any single point of view belongs to any individual player. Rather, 
players are invited to speak for many members of the collective. And the uh, a ninth challenge I'll speak about is that um, all games struggle to align everyone's expectations of a game and mind mailed players to share a picture of what is happening. Um, a GM is supposed to give a sense of place, um, and she does this with few of any physical means to do so. Uh, it's hard to actually express an image of an interstellar vessel in the far future, right? Um, so in the between, a game of Monster Hunters in Victorian England by Jason Cordova, um, this challenge is addressed very elegantly. It uses a GM technique called paint the scene to distribute scene setting amongst the players. If a player arrives in a new area important to the narrative, a player is asked to answer a prepared question that explores an idea about the place she is in. For example, in one scenario, the player characters enter an opium den. The following prompt is then presented to all the players, even if they're not physically in the space itself. Um, so it's it says, quote, paint the scene. People from all walks of life patronize Jenny Johnston's opium den. What do you see that indicates this, end quote? By providing questions that explore an idea about the scene, the question emphasizes what is meaningful. In this case, uh, the paint a scene question reinforces the fact that in this location, social classes mix, which underlines uh, the classism that's imbued in the setting um, by differing from it. So players get interested in the scenes that they help design, um, and they can more easily synergize their mental images of the space. What I find is the biggest challenge some GMS games tackle directly is a very broken era that they see themselves created in. So they do this through form of GMS play itself, and this is very interesting. So toward the end of the 2000s, racially motivated police brutality was more easily spread via social media, and people were more made aware of it. And this gave way to many protests that built up into the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, racially based hatred um, it was captured on display during an anti-Semitic rally uh, that occurred in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. Um, and the organizers stated goals included the unifying of the American white nationalist movement and protesting the removal of a Confederate monument of General Robert E. Lee, a statue viewed as a hate symbol. Um, and Participants in the rally chanted racist slogans and carried weapons. One self-identified white supremacist deliberately rammed his car into a group of counter-protesters, killing a woman. I claim that game designers were not unresponsive to these events, and new GMS game, uh, GMS game designs are a reaction to this intensifying political climate. So... Um, the year after the rally in 2018, uh, for example, Avery Alder and Benjamin Rosenbaum created the duet game book, Dream Apart, Dream Askew. Uh, Dream Askew uh, is a game where players embody members of a queer enclave surviving amidst the collapse of civilization. Dream Apart features an idealist Jewish village, a fantasy version of the 19th century, uh, of 19th century Eastern Europe. These games are both emblematic of a movement in role playing, um, indie role playing, in that they pointedly do not feature a GM. Um, I claim that they both try to topple the central role of the game master, a feature that is resonant with the statue of the slave masters in Charlottesville, statues that were eventually removed. Benjamin Rosenbaum describes in Dream Apart how writing about Jewish life was for him a way of fighting anti-Semitism, meaningful in an era in which Nazi sympathizers are prominent, as in Charlottesville the year prior. He says in the book that, quote, after the chanting Charlottesville, fighting anti-Semitism has never felt less frivolous, end quote. Five years prior to publishing Dream Askew, the writer Avery Alder, Adler, uh, in her keynote talk at Possibilities, a queer gaming marathon, identified games as a type of training for becoming a better human. By creating games that do away with conventional hierarchies, situations in which one player, the GM, has unequal control of others, new ways to play emerge and with them new ways to live. The games inspired by Dream Askew, Dream Apart are not the only GMS games proliferating on the shelves of gaming stores, but they are emblematic of a widespread trajectory 
of games that self-consciously explore what it is okay to include in a game, both politically and structurally. GMs should play GMless games, not just to learn new perspectives on how to address old challenges. I'll say that again. GMs should play GMless games, not just to learn new perspectives on how to address old challenges, but to revisit the wellspring of role-playing itself, which in my view is a, a, an, a, a collaboration, right? That pulses at the heart of the narratives we create together. So thank you so much for listening.